From historically haunted hotels hosting spirits from ages long past, to creepy and classic castles boasting sprawling grounds and their fair share of the supernatural. Spirits, banshees, fairy, and darker things roam the back alleys of Ireland's capital city, which is why the speakeasy is excited and a little nervous to bring you our long-requested list of picks for the most haunted places in the one and only city of Dublin, Ireland. Let's dive right in. Number 5. St. Mikan's Church St. Mikan's Church is an Anglican church located on Church Street in Dublin that holds the impressive reputation as being the oldest parish church on the northern side of the River Liffey. The site that holds the church originally played home to a 5th century Norse chapel, with the first Catholic church being erected much later in 1095. Our current St. Mikan's Church structure was erected in 1685 by architect William Robinson. Its exterior was renovated in 1825. Surprisingly, not much has been altered in terms of the interior since the early 1700s. St. Mikan's is best known for its burial vaults, five long passageways full of dead beneath the church's foundation. These vaults hold the remains of many of Dublin's more influential families of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. While there's no record of the vault's actual construction, some bodies have been dated at more than 800 years old. The chamber's dry conditions have literally mummified those laid to rest there, while causing many of the coffins to disintegrate. Disturbingly, this phenomenon has actually caused mummies to come rolling out towards unsuspecting victims, who we assume either fainted or had to return home for a change of clothing. Despite these horrifying tales, many descend into the tombs every year to see the eerie sight. Following an incident in 2019 in which vandals broke in and desecrated a number of remains, including those of a 400-year-old nun and 800-year-old crusader, tours to the chambers have become much more restrictive. Today, St. Mikan's holds regular services, offering a prime venue for weddings, funerals, and other religious affairs. Tours and visiting options are available to the general public. While tombs and rows of dead may sound spooky all on their own, a slew of reports over St. Mikan's ridiculously long existence have led to a number of local legends detailing the old site's many hauntings. Many of these reports entail strange scratching sounds, disembodied whispers seemingly emanating from mummies, and even the sensation of icy fingers touching or grabbing at one's arms or legs. Before its desecration, due to his massive 6'5 frame in life, an arm of the crusader's body was visible visible from his undersized holdings. It was said that those brave enough to shake his exposed hand would be blessed with good fortune. Since the 2019 vandalism, however, his hulking, restless spirit has been sighted in a blind rage, seeking vengeance from those who might wish to do the tomb further harm. Also reported throughout St. Mikan's are the disembodied voices of crowds chattering, as well as the feeling of dozens, maybe hundreds of unseen bodies pushing against one's person from various angles. Electronics are known to go dead minutes after stepping onto the grounds, shadowy figures are seen darting about, and a number of reports detail personal possessions going missing, only to turn up later in the strangest places. Number 4. The Shelburne Hotel the prestigious Shelburne Hotel, located on the northern side of St. Stephen's Green, is notably housed in an official landmark building and boasts an impressive 265 rooms. The hotel itself was founded in 1824 by one Martin Burke. Burke settled on the location following his purchase of three separate properties overlooking Europe's largest garden square, St. Peter's Green. The hotel itself was named in honor of William Petty, 2nd Earl of Shelburne, Prime Minister of Great Britain from 1782 to 1783, and whom once owned a house on the very same lot. The Shelburne was an instant success. It quickly grew in popularity, drawing in the city's wealthier crowds. It was the first hotel in all of Dublin to be illuminated by gaslight, as well as to offer private drawing rooms. The Shelburne was expanded in 1850. Sadly, Martin passed on in 1863, and the Shelburne was closed for a short time. Eventually, it was repurchased, renovated, and reopened later in 1867. Amid the 1916 Easter Rising, the hotel was occupied by British troops, and was even utilized post-conflict as a makeshift hospital where injured from both sides were welcome for treatment. 
1922, the Irish Constitution was actually drafted in room 112 of the Shelburne. This room is now known as the Constitution Suite. Most recently, the hotel underwent a whopping 18-month renovation and modernization project, reopening again in 2007. Today, Shelburne Hotel is owned and operated by Marriott International, who continues to maintain, cherish, and honor the prestigious structure. It continues to serve patrons faithfully, offering elegant rooms, exquisite dining, and drinks of elite quality. According to local legend, however, fine accommodations aren't the only thing the Shelburne has to offer, and a number of tales of terror surrounding its various paranormal infestations have been brought to light since the hotel's initial opening. In 1965, renowned conspiracy theorist and ghost hunter Hans Holzer, accompanied by medium Sybil Lee, paid the hotel a visit. By Sybil's account, while she was sitting in her room one night, she heard the disembodied sounds of a little girl crying. When she asked the ghost girl, what was wrong, the child answered that she was scared. Sybil then reported feeling the small spirit climb into her bed, sit next to her, and even brush her arm, which in turn instantly felt dead, like pins and needles. Since this instance, it's been speculated that this ghostly little girl may be the spirit of one Mary Masters, who was only seven years old in 1846 when she died during the cholera outbreak. It's thought that Mary lived in one of the buildings that was converted into parts of the hotel. If you're looking for an encounter with Mary, staff and regulars claim her most most frequent haunt is the basement, where she commonly startles unsuspecting staff as they work. Also reported throughout the hotel and suggesting Mary's spirit may not be alone are shadowy figures slinking about, apparitions and clothing from many different eras, unnatural cold spots, and the disembodied sounds of a large party always heard from just out of sight. Lastly, on a handful of occasions, guests have been sent running and screaming in terror from their rooms after experiencing extreme poltergeist activity in the form of faucets turning on and off by themselves, doors slamming dangerously close to fingers, and even lights flicking off on their own, throwing an unnatural darkness over the room and all inside. Number 3. Kilmanham Jail Kilmanham Jail is a former prison turned museum located in none other than the Kilmanham suburb of Dublin that has housed and even executed a number of notable Irish revolutionaries, political prisoners, and heads of various rebellions. Today, it boasts the title of being the largest unoccupied prison in all of Ireland, as well as one of the largest unoccupied prisons in Europe. This lockup was originally constructed as the County of Dublin Jail in 1796 and was intended to replace the older prison. The former prison, which was located only a few meters off-site, was little more than a dungeon. Inmates were not separated by gender or age, and disturbingly, children as young as seven were housed with the general population. During these times, men were supplied a bed to sleep in while women and children were offered straw mats. In 1864, the prison was expanded, remedying growing population concerns. Executions were moved to a new location called Stonebreaker's Yard, located just outside the east wing of the prison. In 1910, following its less than savory conditions being brought to light, the jail closed its doors for a time. They were forced to reopen preceding the Easter Rising of 1916 in an effort to house the Irish Citizens Army as well as the Irish Volunteers. Fourteen leaders were executed in Stonebreaker's Yard. These executions drew heavy criticism from both Irish and British citizens, who found the practice barbaric and later outlawed executions entirely. In 1922, civil war broke out, resulting in rebel control over the prison. At least 77 Republicans were executed at Kilmanham alone. That number infinitely higher when taking into consideration all executions from across the entirety of the country. The jail was finally decommissioned in 1924, following the end of the Civil War. Initially, there was no interest in preserving the nightmarish ruin, namely due to the extreme amount of pain and suffering experienced here. In 1936, the jail was actually considered for demolition, but the cost of destroying the site proved too high. Later, in 1958, the Kilmanham Jail Restoration Society was established in an effort to preserve the historic land. 
the society launched extensive restorations, which lasted a whopping 11 years from 1960 to 1971. Upon their completion, the old site was reopened to the public. Today, Kilmanham Jail acts as a historic site and museum on the history of Irish nationalism. An art gallery on the top floor holds paintings, sculptures, and jewelry of prisoners from all across the nation. Guided tours are readily available for any with an interest. Over the years, both staff and those taking tours have reported a range of supernatural happenings. So many, in fact, that Kilmanham Jail is widely considered one of the most haunted places in Ireland if not the world. And that's not really surprising when one considers that most died here by starvation, disease, murder, execution, or by other brutal means. Those involved in the restoration project begin reporting strange happenings almost immediately. Tools moving on their own, strange knocking sounds. In one instance, a worker painting the dungeon area reported being thrown across the room by an unseen force and pinned to the wall. The man managed to escape but refused to ever set foot in the dungeon again. All throughout the jail, many report disembodied footsteps, extreme cold spots, and cell doors opening and closing on their own. Lights flicker without any known cause, disembodied voices are heard emanating from empty rooms and cells, and several have reported feeling the sensation of being grabbed by invisible hands. It's said that children are especially receptive to Kilmanham's haunts. Many visitors in their younger years report being unable to set foot on the property, just inexplicably freezing at the front gate, as if their flight or fight response is actually refusing to let them enter. A slew of apparitions in old-fashioned clothing are commonly sighted across the premises. Many of these entities are mistaken for actors by those passing, only for them to later be informed that there are no actors on the property. Lastly, an evil presence has been encountered around the chapel balcony. Several spirits have been sighted here as well. Many claim the chapel's infestations are a result of a wedding that took place here long ago. Between Easter Rising leader Joseph Plunkett and his fiancée Grace Gifford, the two lovebirds were eloped mere hours before Joseph's execution by firing squad, in payment for his part in the rebellion. Many stories claim the spirits of both Joseph and Grace remain, vengeful and seeking any who might have played a part in their untimely end. Number 2. Collins Barracks Collins Barracks is a former military barracks turned museum located in the Arbor Hill area of Dublin that is believed to be, get this, the longest consistently serving army base in the entirety of not just Dublin, not just Ireland, but the world. The site the base now sits on was originally gifted to one James Butler, Duke of Ormond, and Lieutenant to Ireland in 1665. Initially, it was known as the Palace Gardens. Planning began for the first barracks on site in 1701, with the Butler family later selling their land to Queen Anne in 1703 for official use in this task. Construction of the barracks lasted six years, beginning in 1704 and concluding in 1710. Affairs were handled by then Surveyor General Thomas Berg. The site was first simply called the Barracks, but would eventually accommodate an addition to title in the form of the Royal Barracks. In 1746, a chapel was designed and constructed. This chapel was later transformed into the Riding School, a place to train cavalry officers as well as their mounts. The complex was originally designed to house over 1,500 men, but by the mid-1750s, more room was required. The buildings underwent several renovations, expansions, and additions, including that of a large marble ballroom. The complex eventually took the name Collins Barracks in 1922, when it was handed over to the Irish Free State. It was named in honor of Michael Collins, first commander-in-chief to the Irish Free State Army, who was actually assassinated earlier the same year. Collins is remembered for a series of heroics he performed during the War of Independence from 1920 to 1921. In 1997, after a ridiculously long career lifespan, the Irish Army finally vacated the complex. It was quickly renovated and remodeled into what would become the National Museum of Ireland's Dublin branch. The barracks, or now museum, remains open to the public to this day, seven days a week, and charges no admission. It hosts the decorative arts and history collection, with exhibits and displays on arts, crafts and wares, and military history. 
Following the 1798 rebellion, leader Wolf Tone was imprisoned here. Rebels caught outside the barracks walls were executed swiftly. Their bodies later disposed of between the barracks and river, at an area now known as Croppy's Acre or Croppy's Memorial Park. Full-bodied apparitions from this time period dressed in Napoleonic uniforms have been sighted from the park to the barracks, while others have reported the full-bodied entities of World War I soldiers many mistaken for actors before all present watched them fade into thin air. One of the most famous apparitions at Collins Barracks is one dubbed the Quartermaster. This bulky, spectral World War I soldier is said to lurk in the East Wing and is commonly sighted walking the corridors and stairs. The apparition of soldiers from various eras, both Irish and British, are commonly sighted marching through the area, chatting or even training, and a menacing shadow figure in what appears to be a 19th century uniform has been known to stalk lone walkers. Also reported in and around the barracks are disembodied voices, the sounds of hoofsteps, phantom gunfire, and doors opening and closing on their own. Some have speculated that countless spirits may be attached to a number of the exhibits and displays, and museum goers often and report watching in shock as full-bodied entities from various eras appear suddenly at their respective displays for only a second before flickering from existence. Lastly, and confined to no area in particular, many report being overcome by the unshakable feeling of being watched or followed. Lights have been known to turn on and off by themselves, sometimes leaving those present in total darkness, and a number of accounts detail instances in which objects move on their own or even float spatially through open air. Number 1. Montpellier Hill Montpellier Hill is a 383-meter hill overlooking Dublin from the south that's a spill-off from the Dublin mountain range that reaches closest to the city. If its official name doesn't ring a bell, a darker ruin on its slopes just might. Dubbed the legendary and infamous Hellfire Club, this paranormal hotspot really needs no introduction. The summit of Montpellier Hill was originally home to a Neolithic passage grave, or burial chamber built directly into the earth and stone that dated back to somewhere between 10,000 and 45,000 BCE. This grave's entrance was marked with a large cairn or stack of sticks and stones. Around 1725, one William Connolly, Speaker of the Irish House of Commons, as well as one of the wealthiest men in all of the land, constructed a hunting lodge on site that he called what else but Montpellier. In the process of its construction, Connolly destroyed the ancient cairn. Rather barbarically, he utilized its stones for portions of his own building, throwing all respect for the dead to the wind. Shortly after construction was completed, ironically, a large storm rolled in and it tore the roof straight from Connolly's lodge. Many claimed it was karmatic justice, the spirit seeking revenge, or God himself punishing William for committing such atrocities. Connolly quickly set to work replacing the roof. He didn't get to enjoy his lodge for long, however, as he died shortly after in 1729. The property was left abandoned for years until finally in 1735 it was rented from Connolly's family by Dublin's infamous Hellfire Club. The club used the old Montpellier Lodge until 1741 for, as some claim, a variety of dark purposes, after which it was left abandoned to stand the test of time. Today, Montpellier Hill and all associated buildings are managed by state forestry company Coilty and are open to the public as parkland. Some legends tell supernatural activity began when Connolly destroyed the cairn, others that strange happenings started after Connolly's death, and others still that something darker lurked there long before Connolly or possibly even the cairn itself ever existed. Some stories claim the Hellfire Club utilized the land for torture, sacrifice, and satanic worship. According to several records, the Hellfire Club actually left the lodge following a large fire. As legend has it, a servant accidentally spilled Build some drink on club member Richard Chappelle Whaley. Whaley, in turn, drenched the servant in brandy and set him on fire. It's said the servant ran around the property in a panic, attempting to douse the flames while setting several portions of the lodge ablaze in the process. When it was all said and done, the flames had claimed most of the lodge, several servants, and a handful of club members, supposedly resulting in the remaining members being forced to leave the property forever. Several claims tell of club members kidnapping, torturing, killing, and even eating those who traveled through the area alone at night. One more prominent tale describing such 
a fate for a local farmer's daughter. Another more famous story surrounding the old clubhouse tells of a stranger in a cloak stopping by the lodge and joining club members in a game of poker. The stranger was good. No, better than good. He seemingly won every hand. He was unbeatable. At one point during the heated game, a member dropped a card by accident and bent to pick it up. It's said that he then noticed the stranger didn't have feet like a normal man's, but instead, cloven hooves. Upon standing and exclaiming his discovery to his peers, they realized they were not in the presence of a stranger, but the devil himself. Just as the member who dropped the card straightened up and the rest of the room turned in shock, flames burst from nowhere around the stranger who quickly disappeared into them before the whole commotion fizzled out and all that was left was a small burn mark on the ground. Another fable tells that a local priest decided to stop by the lodge to confront and hopefully save the club members. When he entered the lodge, it said he found himself face to face with an unnaturally large black cat, with ears so pointed they gave the distinct impression of demonic horns. The cat was said to be sitting in a chair that, according to the club, was reserved for the devil alone. The priest, immediately sensing evil, threw holy water over the cat, attempting to exorcise it. It said the cat instantly let out a vicious growl, then transformed into a devilish creature before running through the front door and disappearing into the night. To this day, both the cat and its other form have been sighted lurking about, mostly after dark, stalking lone walkers ominously, or just watching those passing by. If you encounter this beast, be wary. It's said the priest's exorcism was enough to banish the creature from the lodge itself forever, but not quite enough to return it to hell. And what's more, it's said it's not exactly happy about this fact, that it may be out for blood. Those brave enough to explore Montpellier Hill's sprawling landscape or its ruins also report being overcome with a feeling of inexplicable terror, as if something evil and powerful is there just out of sight, or according to several sources, as if something bad is just about to happen. On several chilling instances, visitors to the hill describe the sensation of something invisible tugging at their clothing, appendages, or even snapping necklaces or bracelets from one person with surprising force. The sounds of a woman screaming are often heard in the middle of the night. These desperate cries are said to emanate from the restless soul of a young woman who was stuffed into a barrel in life, which was, in turn, lit on fire and rolled down a nearby hillside for club members' amusement. For a time, ghost tours and paranormal research groups were held atop Montpellier Hill. These activities have since ceased, some say, due to the nefarious nature of whatever resides there, with many of said group members reporting feeling watched through the entirety of their separate stays, unwelcomed, and with several even describing horrifying instances in which they were literally pushed, grabbed, or hit hard by an invisible presence. Lastly, reported all throughout the area are the disembodied sounds of various voices screaming screaming or crying, unnatural hotspots even in the dead of winter, random feelings of extreme sadness, and shadowy figures that lurk about. Taking into consideration this spooky slope slew of extreme hauntings and darker infestations, coupled with an intriguing, mysterious, and downright wicked history, it was as easy as abracadabra when choosing Montpellier Hill as our pick for the most haunted place in Dublin. Thank you everyone for tuning in to our list of picks for the most haunted places in Dublin. If you enjoyed hearing our history and stories as much as we enjoyed telling them to you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on so you know when fresh content is coming out. Throw us a like if you feel we deserve it, and most importantly, share this upload and our channel with anyone you think could use a good scare. We'll see you all next time.